Good morning. I'm going to invite you to grab a copy of um, God's Word and turn to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 9. Second Samuel chapter 9, we'll begin reading in verse 1. In honor of God's word, I invite you to stand as we read the scripture together, please. And David said, Is there yet any that is left in the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called unto to him, when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Aren't thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan yet had a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Meshur, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then the king, King David, sent and fetched him out of the house of Meshur, the son of Amiel, out of Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his feet and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, Behold, thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of, of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertaineth to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servant shall till the land for him and thou shalt bring in the fruit that thy master's son may have to, food to eat. But Meshivasheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. When then said Ziba unto the king, according to all thy, that my lord, the king, had commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's son. And Mephibosheth had a son, a young son, whose name was Misha. And all that dwell in the house of Ziba were, were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth, verse 13, dwell in Jerusalem, and he did eat continually at the king's table, and was lame on both his feet. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thank you. The grass withered, the flower faded, but the word of our God shall stand forever. This morning, I want to talk to you this morning about the life of David. And when you look at David's life, his life was like a white shirt. I have for many years, over 30 plus years, 35 plus years, I've always wore a white shirt. To work. And my white shirt is always clean. 
and I am pressed and crisp. I got the sleeves creased down the sleeves, creased in the back, creased down the shoulder, always crispy clean. Well, one day, my pen decide for out of nowhere, decide to explode a little and bleed a little. And there was a spot where my pocket is on my shirt. Well, no one noticed the crease on my sleeve, how clean the rest of my shirt is, how well pressed it is, well tucked in. All they noticed was that one spot on my shirt. Amen. And that we have here with the life of David. When you think of David, first thing comes to mind for most was that his sin with Bathsheba, the adulterer. Some well rounded in the Bibles, in their Bible will think of, okay, well, he numbered the people, which he's not supposed to. And that's one of the sins. But let me tell you something. David is a man of God's heart for a reason. And we're going to see that this morning. This morning, I want to talk to you about a story in the Bible that I think is the most beautiful illustrations of God's grace. The kindness of God and how he adopted us into his family. And how we should respond to his kindness. I want us to look at David's heart as revealed in the kindness to Mephibosheth. So that through it, we might see God's kind-heartedness, his, so his sovereignty, God's greater act of kindness towards us. The great evangelist, um, D.L. Moody, once said, the hardest thing for God to do is to make people kind. They can learn the Bible, but still not be kind. They can speak in tongues and still not be kind. They can preach and be in the pulpit and still not be kind. There's a lot of unkind people in our world today. You look around, you look in the news. Unkindness is what makes people outside the church not want to be a Christian. We want to quote verses, but they want to see kindness in us. Amen. Amen. So, first of all, what is kindness? I looked it up, and kindness is a quality of being friendly, generous, considerate, treating people with respect. Kindness, my friend, is greatly needed in our community and in our society today. We see a lot of shooting going on lately in the news, not too far in Rochester. We see a lot on the news of the nation, uprising, anger, all due to the lack of kindness for one another. What I want to look at this morning is two things. What kindness does and what kindness looked like. In relation to David act, the David, how he treats Mephibosheth, you will see how God is a greater act of kindness. Walk with me as to the scripture as we go through it this morning. You see, in 2 Samuel chapter 8, describes David as being in a place in his life where he needs nothing. He is content. But in 2 Samuel chapter 9, just a chapter later, the one who didn't need anything 
is now searching for something, for someone to show the kindness, to show kindness to. In verse 3 of our text, it makes it clear that David understood that his kindness was a derogative of the kindness of God. In other words, David wanted to be kind in order to imitate God, who is a kind-hearted sovereign, he is seeking and searching for someone to be generous to. Is he going to find it here this morning? The Lord is seeking out this morning in Waterloo Baptist Church for someone to show his kindness, his generosity to. Is he going to find anyone here this morning? Because we can only see reality through the limited perspective of our personal experience, Christian often speak of conversion to saving faith in Christ in terms of seeking God. But, my friend, according to Romans chapter 3, verse 10, says that as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understand it. Neither is none that seek it after God. Unrighteous people they don't seek God. Every sinner does what the first sinner does. Adam and Eve, they try to hide from God. And every unconverted sinner is a convicted fugitive on the run from a divine justice who is only saved because of a personal missionary work of the Almighty God. Kindness of God reaches out to the lost. The kindness of God also reaches out because of who He is. I'm a little behind here, excuse me. Because of who He is. Nothing forces David, if you look at the scripture, in verse 1, it says, Is there any that is left at the house of Saul? Nothing forces David to seek out Mephibosheth. He didn't, you know, there's, there's no one there to pressure him to do it. Something within him, within him, move him to reach out in an act of kindness. Likewise, God does not owe you good anything. God owes each of an, each and every one of us divine justice, holy wrath, eternal punishment. God has not treated us as our sin deserved. Instead, what he does, he reach out to us with mercy, with saving grace, Instead, steadfast love and kindness. That's what God does. You know, Ephesians 2, 4 said that, but God who's written mercy for the great love wherein he loved us. Even when we were dead in sin, even when we were dead in sin, had quickened us together with Christ. Amen. By grace are we saved. By grace we are saved. By His grace. By His grace. The kindness of God reaches out to the lost. The kindness of God also reaches out because of who He is. The kindness of God reaches out for the sake of another. The reason why David searched out for someone to show kindness to was because of 
Mephibosheth's father, who was Jonathan. Jonathan and David were were best friends, man. They they were they were together, man. They were tight. Uh, Jonathan loved David so much that that he was he supported him. He protected him because of um, uh, Saul's wrath, his father's wrath against David. He supported him for that. He also supported his ascension to the throne of Israel, and even. Though he was Saul's son, and he was rightly entitled to that throne, he acknowledged that David was going to be the one on that throne. Amen. Now, they were, they love each other. And we're not talking about that forbidden love. We're talking about a love that is tied between two friends. You know, in 1 Samuel um, chapter 18 and 20, David and Jonathan entered a cave, a covenant with each other. David had promised um, to be kind to Jonathan household after David was promoted and Jonathan would be killed. In Second Samuel nine, our text today, we see that David looks for someone from Jonathan's household to whom he can show the loyal love of God. David was generous. David was gracious to Mephibosheth for the sake of another, Jonathan. Sound familiar? Amen. God is gracious to us for the sake of another, Jesus. How many of you have seen the movie... The what was it? The Last Emperor. How many have seen it? How many of one? Two? I got two person? Well, in the movie The Last Emperor, there was a young, a young child who was who was the, basically that's it, the last emperor of China. Um, he lives a what do you call it? A, a, a magical life of luxury with thousands of servants um, at his command. Well, his brother asked him one day as to um, what would happen when someone does do something wrong. The, the young emperor replied, when somebody do something wrong, somebody else is punished for it. To demonstrate, he broke a jar and one of his servants was beaten severely for that. Not him, but the servant was beaten for that. My friend, Jesus Christ will verse that pattern. When the servant wrong, the king was punished. In Isaiah 53, verse 4, it said, let me read it for you. Turn with me to Isaiah. Let me show you this. Isaiah 53, verse 4. It says, surely had he borne our grief and carried our sorrow, yet we did esteem him with, esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord, and that Lord on him, the iniquity of us all. Jonathan, David, demonstrate the mercy of God towards us. In Second Corinthians 5.21, it said that, For he had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The kindness of God reaches out to the lost. The kindness of God reaches out to the cause of who he is. The kindness of God reaches out 
for the sake of another. And the kindness of God reaches out in spite of us. In spite of us. Back in our text, we see Ziba was Saul's servant who took care of Saul's property, his estate. When David called him to inquire about the surviving members of Saul's and Jonathan family, Ziba records that, if you look at the scripture, Ziba says that basically he, he just said, well, there's another one that um, there's a member of Saul's family. He didn't call him by name. I want you to notice that. He didn't call him by name. But what he did was he called Mephibosheth. Oh, by the way, Mephibosheth, his name means destroyer of shame or someone who put away shame. Well, look at verse 3. David asked him, who is left of the house of Saul? And he says, and the king said, there is not yet any of the Saul Saul that can show the kindness of God to. And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan yet had a son which is lame on his feet. Ziba introduces Mephibosheth by his condition. Not by his name, but by his condition. He's lame on his feet. Now according to Second Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, we see, you see the story as to how Jonathan, the friendship was only like, I think it was five years old, when Saul and Jonathan died. The, the, the nurse that was taking care of him picked him up and ran because they were in fear, because they feared that the royal family would be next, be targeted next. You see, back in those days, and that's what they do when a, um, a royal, when a new monarchy come into power, the old monarchy family is wiped out. So there's no contention to the throne. And that's what we have here, because if you remember Psalm Solomon, he killed Adonijah because he was in contention to the throne. He wanted to be king. So Ziba reports Mephibosheth's condition to say that, to say to the king that, don't bother with him. He's not worth, I mean, he's lame, he can't help you, nor can he hurt you. What do you need him for? But undeterred by Ziba, unflattering description of him, David replied, where is he? In verse 4, where is he? Ziba reported that Mephibosheth was hiding out in a in a home of a benefactor in Lodabar. In Lodabar. Now the name Lodabar means no pastor. And um, by the way, no Lodabar, later on in this in Second Samuel, you see when David ran from um, Absalom, this is one of the places he went to, was Lodabar. What is Lodabar? Now, we don't know much about Lodabar, but scholars agree that it's a place, it's a name was meant to indicate that it was a barren place. It was an unfruitful place. It was a terrible place. My friend, we are in a world today that is a barren world. This world has nothing to offer us but temporal happiness. Nothing. It's barren. The Mephibosheth was a crippled man from a fallen dynasty, living in a horrible environment. Yet David reached out to him in kindness. And in verse 5, David sent for Mephibosheth and brought him from Lodabar, from no pasture, to him. That what grace does for us. God reaches out to us in spite of us. In spite of our condition, He reaches out to us. In Ephesians 2.8, 
said, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself. It is a gift from God, not of works that that man should boast. So it's, so what does this all mean? What does this all mean for us today? Simple. We see what kindness does. Amen. Now let's see what it means. One, kindness of God means that you do not have to be afraid of the wrath of God. Amen. You don't have to be afraid of the wrath of God. Now imagine you are um, Mephibosheth. And one night you hear at your door, look out the window, and it's the, the soldiers, David's soldiers, surrounded your house, want to drag you from lower the bar to Jerusalem. Mephibosheth must have seen his whole eyes flash in front of him. Must have been scared. He knew how it went. He knew that his family is going to be destroyed. He's probably going to be beaten or killed. But David embraced him. Embraced him like a lost friend. Like a long lost friend. It's like, oh, Mephibosheth. Can you imagine the sense of terror that was, that must have, um, consumed Mephibosheth when he met the king finally all that he saw that he would be beaten and tortured and there was like absolutely nothing he could do about it to stop it but imagine his surprise when David when King David said to him, Don't fear, for I will show you kindness. I will show you kindness. David's kindness removed Mephibosheth's fear. God's grace does the same thing for us, my friend. It does the same thing for us. We can be confident and sing out loud on top of our voice what Psalms 27, 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength. Strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? Ah! God's kindness means that we do not have to fear the judgment, the, 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 the wrath, the... the uh, condemnation of God. Isn't God awesome? Isn't He marvelous? That's His grace towards us. In John 10, 28, Jesus said, I give unto you eternal life, that they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. It didn't say greater than some. It didn't say greater than most. It's great, greater than all. And what does all mean, by the way? What does all mean? All means all. That's all all means. Amen? Let's say that together. Ready? All means all. That's all all means. Good. Now we got it. All means all. No man is able to pluck him out of my hand. None. Praise God. Man. Praise God that, that, that you don't have to fear, be afraid of death, hell, or the grave. What does that got to do? You know, it's like that, that song, I just love this song, where it said, what have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arm. What, oh, it goes again. Um, have I perfect peace with my Lord so near? Leaning on the everlasting arm. Now, don't get 
making smart remark about my singing because uh, I heard some of you guys, some of you sons, this is horrible as I am. So no criticism there. So what does it mean? It means the kinds of God means that you don't have to be afraid of his wrath. The kinds of God means that you don't have to be ashamed of how weak you are. Of how weak you are. In verse 7 of our text, David promised to show kindness to Mephibosheth. David vowed to restore Saul's property to Mephibosheth. David assure Mephibosheth. You know, I wish there was a shorter name I could call, like a nickname. You know, that's, that's a mouthful to be repeating all the time. Um, maybe you can call him Meth or something like that, or Seth. Seth. Uh, whatever. Sounds good. <laughs> Alright, so David assured Mephibosheth a permanent place at his table in Luke 22.30 says that that ye may eat and drink at my table in that in my kingdom and sit on throne judging the twelfth tribe of Israel. Christ, my friend, offered the same thing. The same thing David offered Mephibosheth to us. Amen. These overwhelming gift must have made Mephibosheth skeptical because if you look at verse 8, look what he says in verse 8. He said, and he bowed himself and said, what is thy servant that thou should look upon such a dead dog as I am? You know, one of the most degrading things you could call a person in David's days, or probably in our days as well, is to be called a dog. You know, and a person to call himself a dog would be a great act of self-deprecation that expresses humble submission to an, to an, before a, a superior authority. But, but, note that Mephibosheth does not call himself a dog. What he did is call himself a dead dog. A dead dog. I forgot how that um, that phrase went, where it says um, a, a live dog is better than a dead lion, um, because within that dog, who's alive, because he's alive, there's hope. There is no hope for the dead lion, even though he's king of the jungle. That's how Mephibosheth felt. Mephibosheth saw himself. He saw himself less than nothing, worse than the worst, lower than a rock bottom. But that's not how David saw him. And neither, that's not how God sees you and I. He looked beyond that. We all need to be kind people. And that's one of the things I love about Waterloo Baptist Church. When we first came here, we see your heart, how kind you are to my family, me and my family. You are a kind-hearted people. Amen. And I appreciate that. My sure my family and Nicholas Father the same thing. We appreciate your kindness to us. We all need more kind in our community. We all need more kindness in our society these days. Like they say, you you know, you draw more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. My friend, this is why a lot of people don't have a lot of friends. Because they're just unkind. They're just so unkind. I mean, nobody wants to be around an unkind person. Am I wrong or right? Amen. Am I wrong or right? You know, that goes for Christian too. Now, this all means that the kind of God means you don't have to be afraid of his wrath. It means that you don't have to be ashamed of your weakness. And then third, it means that the kind of God lifts up the fallen. Lifts up the fallen. I'm almost done. Almost done. 
I'm going to tell you the same thing I told um, Britney Spears on her first husband. I ain't going to keep you long. In verse 6 and 8, David records, um, records David's conversation with, um, with him and uh, Mephibosheth. I got to call it, find a shorter name for him. Verse 6 and 8 records the conversation between those two. But verse 9 and 11 really records David's conversation with, with Ziba and Mephibosheth. Because then the king said, look at it, said, Then the king said unto Ziba, Thy, Thou saw servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy, thy master's son all that pertaineth to his soul and all to his house. Thou therefore and thy son and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, master, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to thy word, O my lord the king, I commanded thy servants, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, the king, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's son. He, David, restored him all the land of Saul and Jonathan. David did not have to do that, my friend. He didn't have to do that. He could have kept all these things to himself. He could have not kept this promise to Jonathan. He could have put Mephibosheth on a, I don't know, a royal welfare system, you know, and just kept it all to himself. But David gave it all to Mephibosheth. It was so great that verse 10, yeah, verse 10 says it would take Ziba's 15 sons and 20 servants to take care of the land. That's how vast we're talking about here. With one decree from the king, Mephibosheth went from living with someone else's, in someone else's house in Lodabar to owning his own royal estate. That is what grace does. God's kindness lifts us up. Four times in the scripture, we see four times in verse 7, verse 10, verse 11, and verse 13 that we are told that David gave Mephibosheth a permanent place at his table. This was a subtle form of house arrest so you can keep an eye on him. No, this wasn't a handout for physical needs for food or anything like that. No, David gave Mephibosheth so much that it would take some 35 people to take care of it. The table at David's table in verse 11 said that Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. So in a sense, David adopted him. Imagine when the, everyone comes in, if you look in verse, um, the next chapter over, in verse 8, toward the end of verse 8, you see all the people that were at the table, would at the table. You have, um, Joab, the son, um, was a host. You have, um, uh, Josaphat, uh, who was a recorder. You have, uh, uh Zadok and, uh, uh, Ahimelech, which, uh, which you have two priests there. You have the scribes there. You have, uh, who else you had there? You, you got, um, um, Abenahi. You have all these people, these generals coming in, into his house, one by one, seated at the table. And then you have Mephibosheth comes in, and how are you very brought in, put on the table. And all of a sudden the tablecloths cover your legs. And you know what? Mephibosheth looked just like the rest of them. God, my friend, covers us as well. You know, 
we said when we eat at his table continually and was lame on his feet in verse 13. We are all crippled by sin. We are all been lame on our feet. And by the way, feet in the Bible most, most of the time refers to our walk. Our walk. All things are possible, the Bible says, to him that believeth. He can heal us from our lameness. We can come to Jesus and accept his grace that he offers us. Just like Mephibosheth, and eat at his table continually. My friend, what better example of grace what better example of the kindness of God in the Bible than this story? It really shows how God is kind. We need more kindness in the world. We need more kindness in our community. And let's, as a church, let's be kinder to other people. Let's spread that joy. That's my challenge for you this morning. Because we can be adopted as a child of God. In Ephesians 4.32 said, Be ye kind one to another. Tender hearted. Tender hearted. Forgiving one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. That's the story of David. Man's up to God. You see why he's called that? Let's be kind to one another. Father in heaven, all oh, glorious it is. We need, we need you, Lord. Because only in you, through you, we can have peace. We surrender, O oh Lord, that we are unable to do it on our own. Help us, O oh Lord, with the Holy Spirit. Minister to us, Lord, that we may show the goodness of your mercy to others. Lord, we thank you and we give you praise this morning in your Son, Jesus' name.